ok uh, we will get started. So, we are continuing with loops and uh, today we will go from the basic while loop to the more uh, general and sometimes easier to write for loop. Strictly speaking you do not need a for loop you can manage everything with while, but for syntactic convenience people very often use while loops especially in conjunction with arrays and we will start looking at array manipulation today as well. So, most of this lecture will be a large number of simple and moderately simple examples of using loops for doing interesting computations. So, we will just continue on last times theme, but we will get to see much many more examples. So, let us remember the counting problem that uh, led to this sequence that we had to solve for. Um, if I say that a bit vector uh, sequence of bits has length len, then uh, the number of possible bit vectors of that length is just 2 to the power len as we have seen. But if I further constrain these strings so that none of them can have 2 or more consecutive zeros, then the number will of course decrease from 2 to the power n. Some strings will be disqualified. So, if I dictate that the length is 1, then there are 2 possible strings and none of them can possibly have 2 consecutive zeros, it is just 0 and 1. If uh, length is equal to 2, then in all there are 4 possible strings, but one of them 0 0 is disqualified. So, the remaining number of legitimate strings is 3, which are 0 1 1 0 and 1 1. Now, suppose a of length a is a function a of len is the number of sequences that end with a 0 um, of length len and which do not have 2 consecutive zeros and b of len is the number of sequences of length len without 2 consecutive zeros which end in a 1 ok. So, we define these 2 functions of len. Now, the required answer is of course, a len plus b len because the string has to end with either a 0 or a 1 and if the sequence ends with a 0 then the second last bit has to be a 1 otherwise we will get a consecutive uh, set of 2 uh, zeros. Therefore, a of len has to be equal to b of len minus 1 ok. By the formulas we have set up by the definitions we have set up uh, if a of len sequences end with 0 and b of len sequences end with 1 then if the sequence end with a 0 then the second last bit must be 1 and therefore, a len equal to b len minus 1. However, if a sequence ends with a 1 then there is no restriction on the second last bit because I will not be introducing any duplicate zeros either way. And so, the second last bit could be either 0 or 1. Therefore, b of len is equal to a of len minus 1 plus b of len minus 1. So, we look at the number of strings of length 1 less and then we add them up because the last bit is already decided to be 1 ok. So, this defines a system of mutual recurrences. So, b of len depends on a of len minus 1 and b of len minus 1, a of len depends on b of len minus 1. But the structure of the recurrence is fairly simple in that a can be eliminated easily out of this game and we can thereby get a recurrence only in terms of b ok. So, b of len is equal to b of len minus 2 which is a of len minus 1 plus b of len minus 1 and most of you will recognize this as the Fibonacci sequence, but it is also known as the Hemchandra numbers who is now credited to have discovered it centuries before Fibonacci. So, the base case for b itself is b of 1 equal to 1. So, remember b of len is the number of strings ending with 1 ok. Now, if the length is itself 1 then that only bit can be 1. So, the bit sequence is 1 and if b uh, of 2 is equal to 2. If you are given 2 bits then uh, if it has to end with 1 then the previous bit can be either 0 or 1. So, there are 2 possible combinations. So, b of 1 is equal to 1 and b of 2 is equal to 2. So, these are the base cases. Now, if I am given an integer len and I read that from c in and the len turns out to be either 0 or 1, then there is nothing to do. I just print out len itself as b of len. Otherwise, I have to do some more work. And after the base cases, note that b of len depends only on b of len minus 1 and b of len minus 2. Therefore, in this calculation it is not necessary to keep the entire sequence of b's from the beginning. I can just remember the last 2 values and get by. So, look at this example. 
suppose up to this point I have computed b of 1, b of 2, b of 3 which is the sum of the previous two numbers and b of 4 which is 5 sum of the previous two numbers. Let us have an index variable called lx which takes values from 1 to len and finally outputs the value for len and blx is the value of the function b at argument or input lx blx minus 1 and blx minus 2. So, let us say at the moment I know lx as 4 okay, 1 2 3 4 I know blx as 5 I know blx minus 1 as 3 and blx minus 2 as 2. So, note that after this calculation is done there is no need for the number 1 I can afford to forget it. Okay. Now, what do I do in the next step? The important thing in writing these kinds of linear recurrence loops is to get the body of the loop right in the sense of the correct order of assignments to variables to forget the past and shift ahead to the future. Okay. So, observe that to calculate the next value in this cell I will only be requiring 3 and 5 and not 2. So, I will destroy the value 2 I will forget it by switching the value of the variable blx minus 2 to the next value 3 by just copying blx minus 1 into blx minus 2. Okay. Now that 1 and 2 have disappeared from the program state the next step I take is to copy the contents of blx namely 5 into blx minus 1. So, now if you will blx minus 1 points to the value 5 okay. we do not actually have an array we have just 3 variables. Now blx becomes free so to speak and lx we will increase to 5 and blx will now point to this so called cell there is nothing in it yet logically and then we will calculate blx as blx minus 1 plus blx minus 2 and that will give us the next value. So, this is the entire sequence of operations inside the loop it is very important to get the sequence within the statements right otherwise you might be damaging a variable you need in future. Okay, or uh, you know not getting rid of a variable like 2. So, after you have computed the basic step 2 will go the way of 1 2 is lost in history and we do not care about it and we keep on doing this shift. Okay. So, the else clause we will assume that len is at least 3 because if len is 1 or 2 we know how to give the answer directly. So, we initialize b l x minus 1 to 1 b l x uh, minus 2 to 1 and b l x minus 1 to 2 okay. and then we initialize l x to 3. So, the initial condition is where lx is pointing here and we would like to compute blx as 3 itself the first value. Okay. We do not actually compute blx we start the loop saying let lx start from 3 and the input is len. Okay. So, now suppose for the easy case that len is exactly equal to 3 the first non base case. So, if len is exactly equal to 3 then the test lx less than len fails and the body of the while loop is not executed. So, you exit the while loop right away and at the end you print len which is 3 and blx minus 2 plus blx minus 1 which is also 3. So, that is correct in the case where there are 0 iterations of the while loop body. Now, suppose len is equal to 4. Okay. So, now we will enter the loop and evaluate blx equal to um, 3. Okay, uh, 1 plus 2 and lx will shift to 4 okay. and uh, then I will do this switch. See this switch is goes in that order the minus 2 guy shift to the minus 1 guy the minus 1 guy shift to the current guy. Okay. So, now we will have 2 and 3 and so in case I add it up I will be printing 5 okay. and this goes on you can verify that by induction that there is this invariant that the true value of the function b at l x is always equal to b l x minus 1 plus b l x minus 2 okay, no matter how many times you evaluate the loop. So, here is a case where you have to write down this loop invariant and this is the loop invariant you want that is the proof of that depends critically on the ordering of these statements. Okay, this has to happen first this has to happen next. So, that is how you can compute Fibonacci numbers. Now, uh, many of you will know that the Fibonacci numbers uh, do not grow as fast as 2 to the power len, but they still grow exponentially with a smaller base. The base is approximately 1.6. Okay. So, even Fibonacci numbers will grow exponentially and within very modest values of len 
your uh, b of l x will exceed integer capacities. So, even if you want to compute Fibonacci numbers for large numbers you might wish to use doubles. Yes. Um, and the output uh, that is a good question see the invariant is the loop will keep on executing until L x becomes equal to len. So, they are the same value anyway. If you look at the condition for the while execution while L x is less than len it will continue working and so by the time you come out L x will be equal to len. Okay, so, printing L x here and printing len here is the same thing. Huh? No, the thing is set up so that you do have to do that final addition, but you can write an equivalent different loop with a different sequencing, but with the property you are looking for. So, this is how you would compute simple uh, linear recurrences between discrete variables in time. So, the next example is actually a simpler one, but has the same flavor. So, suppose I want to print running averages the user inputs a potentially unending sequence of numbers. After the third number is input um, and for every subsequent input print the three point running average. So, let us have variables a 1, a 2, a 3 which hold the latest three numbers. You might want to use this kind of a program for example, in computing uh, smooth temperature variations in a room. So, you read the temperature every minute and maybe there is some local disturbance in the air flow. So, you do not want to overreact to a particular reading because it could be noisy or the sensor may have some dust on it. So, you want to do a running average over a small window of temperatures to get a smoother estimate of the temperature in various parts of the room. So, that is one example of why you might want to code up running averages. So, we set the last three temperatures in A 1, A 2, A 3 where A 3 is the most recent one and A 1 is the oldest temperature. And then because we need three numbers to get primed we read those three indirectly. And then we have this infinite loop where we print the average and then again just like the pointer switching in the previous diagram a 1 takes the value of a 2, a 2 takes the value of a 3 and now a 3 is freed up. So, you can read the next temperature from C in ok. To fit on the screen I have written this in the same line, but standard syntax you should write it in separate lines ok. So, that is a very simple example of managing so called pointer. So, you have a finite number of variables you do not or cannot remember the entire history you might be measuring the temperature every millisecond for 10 years. So, you do not want all that storage you decide how much storage you need and systematically forget the past ok. We can do simple tricks here for example, uh, suppose we say that recent temperatures are more important than you know temperatures in the distant past. Suppose I can I have a buffer which keeps the last uh, <coughs> 20 days of temperatures ok and I decide that the so called running average will be a weighted average where the current day has say weight uh, 1 yesterday has weight half the day before has weight 1 fourth and so on ok. So, now that we know about binary representation you should figure out how to maintain running averages with that definition ok. So, it should be fairly efficient think about it ok. So, in general geometric decay is easy to deal with. Um, other kinds of decay functions may or may not be easy to deal with. So, there is this whole area of stream processing and sensor data processing which deals with problems like that. How can you keep very limited memory sketches of a time series of measurements temperature, pressure, humidity, call details in a router or a telephone network and then collect statistics of it on the fly in a moving window ok. That is a very important area of computer science as well. Uh, next example. Um, migrations between two cities. So, let us say the two cities have initial populations m and p uh, which we will represent in doubles. Every year one fourth of one city migrates to the other city and half of the other city migrates to this city and suppose you want to simulate this for k years and one of the important questions is do the population stabilize or will one city just keep growing and growing ok. So, here is a candidate piece of code. So, you said you start off with the populations in variables m and p and read in the number of iterations as well as the initial populations and then you simulate the time steps t equal to 0 through k or 0 through k minus 1. Uh, we take the population of uh, Pune we migrate half of them to Mumbai and we import one fourth of Mumbai into Pune right. And in the next step we take Mumbai we reduce it by one fourth of itself and add half the population of Pune. 
So, is that ok or is there a problem with this? Right. So, this is called a loop carried dependency ok. So, the semantics of the problem as specified on the previous page basically says that you know people note down the population through the year and they do not make any moves on 31st December they decide that based on the population in the previous year they will do something that is called a synchronous update semantics of course, in real life it does not happen like that. But if the problem is set up as a synchronous update problem then that is a loop carry dependency which violates that specification and therefore, that is wrong ok. Um, so, this is a asynchronous update where p changes on the fly inside the loop body if you do not want that then you have to create temporary variables ok. So, you have to say something like p nu equal to that formula and then m nu equal to the other formula and then you assign p to p nu and m to m, m nu ok. So, this is not a contrived example there are many cases in sort of iterative numerical analysis where asynchronous updates may be slow to converge or even incorrect and synchronous updates are proved to be correct or faster in that case you have to carefully code synchronous updates which of course, need more space in this case there are only two variables involved. So, no one would feel it, but if you are updating matrices or big vectors and they fill up almost all of RAM and if two copies of your vector would not fit in RAM then you have to do some separate arrangement for it ok. So, when we look at more detailed matrix algorithms like eigenvalues and eigenvectors we will see examples of this ok. So, I am just creating more and more examples and giving some salient points of each. So, you can see the you know intricacies of doing loop programming correctly and efficiently. So, the next example most of you will know about how to calculate the GCD of two numbers. So, given two integers m and n where m is greater than equal to n greater than equal to 1 find their GCD ok. Now, it is well known that if h is the GCD of m and n then of course, h divides both of them and if m is equal to n q plus r given h divides both m and n it has to divide r ok. So, therefore, h divides the GCD of n and r and so, h is less than equal to the GCD of n and r it is also quite easy to convince yourself that h is greater than equal to the GCD of r. So, in other words GCD of m n is exactly equal to the GCD of n and m percent n m percent n is the remainder when m is divided by n in other words r ok. Note that I flipped the arguments around and did not write m percent n and n see because the convention was that the first argument is at least as large as the second one ok. So, when I divide m percent n is always less than n ok. So, I arranged it again so that the larger argument is again in the beginning ok and we will assume that to write the code. Um, so, let us say I read integers m and n from c in and let us assume that the programmer will enter it in the correct order otherwise we can always change it by doing max and min uh, and while n is greater than 0 ok the GCD of 1 number and 0 is defined to be the positive number. So, while n is greater than 0 again it is an issue of synchronous update I cannot you know I have to change two values simultaneously arguments which used to be m and n have to become n and m percent n right. So, I save n in temp I overwrite n with m percent n and then I write m equal to temp. So, the elementary step is to take arguments m n to n and m percent n. So, I save n in temp I overwrite n with m percent n and then I write m to temp which will turn out to be the old n ok. Again this is very simple the only important thing is inside the loop you have to be careful in the order in which you save variables and overwrite variables otherwise you will get it wrong fine and finally, when n has gone to 0 you print the other variable that is the GCD. You know, there is not nothing much to uh, demo about this, but here is that code ok. Um, so, let us say I enter 12 and 8 I get 4. So, 12 and 8 turns into 8 and 4, 4 and 0, 4. Um, suppose I enter 13 and 7 I get 1 ok. So, this is correct 
So, is this assumption really required uh, that m is greater than equal to n? What happens if I enter something in a illegal order where the first input is less than the second? Can you think of an example which will give a wrong answer? Will it matter? Suppose the second argument is bigger. Okay, so there are two uh, opinions here. One is that there will be no problem, it will just be reversed and the other is that, uh, what is the other opinion that there will be a mistake in case? The small, the, so, someone says the smaller number will be output immediately. So, let us see, I will try uh, say 7 and 13 instead of 13 and 7, okay. So, why did it get interchanged? Right. So, sometimes it may work out, but I will leave you to you know get convinced that either way that there is something wrong with this code in case the input is not given in the order versus either order will work fine, okay. So, think about that. So, sometimes specifications can be automatically satisfied without your. So, as I said uh, you can have real fun with loops only when you come to arrays because it does not suffice to have repeated computation you need to have repetitive data structures. So, arrays is the first example of a repetitive data structures. So, we have already introduced strings which are basically an array of characters, but luckily uh, unlike in the old C native strings uh, with null termination, we do not need to worry about who allocates the space and where the space comes from, where the space goes, okay. The system keeps track of how to allocate the space, how long a string currently is. So, the string class was designed to do all these things for you conveniently. So, all we have to know is that we can assign two strings, we can say string message equal to hello world. Uh, we can append two strings. So, you can say message equal to message plus foo that will just append that string to the old string. We can read out a position, we can say C out uh, less than less than message of px for position px or we can write into a position as well. We can say message px equal to q, okay. So, so there are two flavors in which message px is used. If message px appears as a right hand side, then message px will pull out the character that is inside position px of the string. But as if message px appears on the left hand side of an assignment, then message px means the particular memory cell where a character is to be written. So, when you say message px equal to q, then it says write q into the px th cell of message. As long as you know all that, that is all we need for today, okay. The rest is just using loops to do fun stuff on strings, okay. So, here is the example. Um, suppose you want to print a string in reverse, that is pretty easy we read the string from C and using get line. So, what is the difference between C in greater than greater than message versus uh, get line C in message. So, if you use C in greater than greater than message then it finishes reading at the first white space, okay. Uh, whereas, if you do get line it reads until you hit the new line even if you have spaces in your string that whole thing will be read into message, okay. So, you read the whole message up to the end of the line and excluding that new line, the new line is not read. Now, since you have to print it out in reverse order, remember if a string is 5 characters long, the positions are numbered 0 through 4, okay, not 1 through 5. So, we set m x to be the last position which is message dot size minus 1, okay. Dot size is the method you call on the message to get its current length, okay. We will see more of that when we do object oriented programming. Now, we will do a while loop which is while m x is greater than or equal to 0, we print out the contents of the cell m x and then you decrement m x by 1. So, it is very easy and this is an example where m x changes completely predictably inside the loop, okay. Contrast that. So, of course, we know that this will terminate because I started out with m x equal to some length like 4 and then clocked it down and it has to hit 0 at some point. So, it is very simple. Contrast that with uh, the GCD problem where uh, there is no such simple looping on any variable, okay. But yet we are very confident that the GCD program will terminate, why is that? So, if you want to be really formal the proof is slightly more involved, okay. The GCD program always terminates because see the every step the input was m n, it became n and m percent n, okay. What is the relationship between these two? See these what happens is at least one of these two numbers will strictly decrease, that is the property. 
because when you divide m percent n that is strictly less than n ok. So, the property you are looking for to show termination is that at least one of the numbers strictly decreases and therefore, you know since n is always the smaller number eventually n will hit 0. So, that is the argument. So, earlier I talked about loop invariance to prove termination you need a property called loop variance loop invariant and loop variant. So, you have to show that certain properties are monotonically changing and then that there is some wall at which the property will hit and that will make the loop terminate ok. So, GCD is a very easy case of course, iterating over a, an array is trivial that you will terminate. Sometimes if you have complicated while loops it takes quite a lot of you know uh, convincing that the loop will actually terminate at some point. So, this is a simple way. Um, now, if the loop is very predictable and the m x the so called looping variable has this simple structure of being initialized at some end and clocking through finishing up at the other end then while is too cumbersome to write and that is why the for loop was created ok. So, the while statement looks like while condition statement as we have already seen you evaluate the condition if it is false you exit immediately if it is true you execute the statement then you check the condition again ok. The for loop has some syntactic sugar it is called syntactic sugar uh, to ease the life a little bit. So, it allows some sort of initialization code in it then it checks for a condition if the condition is false it exits already if the condition is true it evaluates first the statement in the loop body and then the stepper code the stepper code changes something in particular it can change p x the position where you are reading in the string after evaluating the stepper code it goes and reevaluates the condition and it continues like that. So, that is the semantics of the for statement. So, if we take this printing a string in reverse and write it in for it is going to be much shorter just 3 or 4 lines. So, you would say int m x equal to message dot size minus 1 semicolon m x greater than equal to 0 which is the condition to check and the stepper is minus minus m x ok. Now, observe that the init code is executed only once whereas, the condition code is executed as many, as many times as it is found true followed by the last false ok. So, in case you are trying to get squeeze out the last bit of performance from your machine you need to make sure that the condition evaluator is faster than the init evaluator. In this case that is actually the situation because the size method will be called only once in the beginning whereas, uh, m x greater than equal to 0 is a very very fast check between two integers. Uh, you could also have code which looks like printing the string in the ordinary order which of course, is provided to you, but just as a demo you could say for int m x equal to 0 and then you say m x less than message dot size and because no one needs the old value of m x in the stepper you just do plus plus m x instead of m x plus plus and then you do your calculations here. So, observe that the um, the check now involves this function call and later on we will see that method calls and function calls have substantial overhead in many cases ok because the architect the machine has to do some special things to remember what to do after the method returns. So, this may be a little expensive. So, instead uh, if the size of the message is not changing inside the loop that is an important check if the string is not manipulated inside the loop then you can change the code to say m x equal to 0 comma declare another variable m n which is the size. So, the init is done only once and then in the test you just say m x less than m n. So, this is a very fast test between two integer variables and then you do plus plus m x here. So, in case this method is expensive this can save you substantial time. So, that is um, a tip for writing in a faster for loops, but coming back to the example um, also observe that the initialization code can declare new variables. So, integer m x. So, m x the variable comes into being when the init code is called and you can use m x just like any other variable inside the for loop. So, inside you can use m x and anything that was declared outside the for loop earlier. The variable m x ceases to exist when the for loop is terminated ok that is as per the ISO standard. Older compilers will sometimes 
let m x leak beyond the termination of the for loop that is usually considered a bad uh, implementation feature because you, you know programmers may write multiple loops one after the other and they may pick up the same variable and forget to initialize it and then you will pick up some stale value from a previously terminated loop. So, that is generally not such a good idea. So, G++ has been uh, moving over to ANSI or ISO standards and uh, if you look at this code where I start off a loop with i, I close the loop and then I just assign j to i just to test what the compiler will do. Um, so, some old C++ compilers will let you do this, G++ will complain saying name lookup of i change for ISO for scoping and if you still want to see i here then you have to give a flag saying be permissive. Okay, strict uh, ISO semantics will not let you use i once the loop terminates and that is how you should keep it okay. do not depend on using i after the loop. So, loops can of course be nested most non trivial programs will nest uh, loops to do useful computation. So, as a simple example let us calculate pi again we have been calculating pi for a while now and this time we will do it using a very simple counting technique we will generate a uniform grid of x y points in the plane we will draw a circular disk of a large radius and we will count whether each grid point lies inside the circle or outside and that will be an approximation to the area of the circle ok. So, here is the code. So, I declare a radius let us say start off with something modest say 100 okay. um, and inside counts the number of grid points I have found inside it is declared as double and radius is also declared as double because I will be dividing later on. Um, so, what I do is I take x from minus radius to plus radius in steps of 1 ok and if you want to be uh, symmetric about it I can say less than equal to ok and similarly y goes from minus radius to plus radius in steps of 1. Now, I detect if the point x y is inside the circle by saying x square plus y square less than equal to radius squared that is the test ok. Now, observe that this involves only direct floating point multiplications which are implemented in hardware. It would be bad to say square root of this quantity less than equal to radius because square root as you know involves a function call to a library which does all kinds of complicated things ok. So, you would like to avoid that at the same time observe that the quantity x and y are changing through iterations of the loop, but the quantity radius times radius is a constant. So, that is one place where declaring radius as const can help see the compiler can understand that no one can ever update radius and so radius times radius is also a constant expression which can then be pulled outside the two loops. So, radius times radius computation is only done once ok it will not be done so many times so, the compiler automatically looks takes care of that. And if the point x y is found to be inside the disk then I increment the counter inside by 1. Finally, I write out pi as inside over radius over radius. So, pi r squared is equal to inside and therefore, pi is approximately inside over radius squared. So, and then I print it out to a lot of digits to see what happens. So, very simple piece of code. Um, so, I do this. So, 3.1417. So, it was pretty instant if you want to see how much time was actually taken you say time a dot out. So, it claims ok. So, you get this three times you get real user and system. Now, the real time is the wall clock time ok. Now, your code is coexisting in the system with all kinds of system routines the desktop manager maybe a web browser and you know the CPU is multitasking between them all the time. So, the more accurate no notion of the time the CPU takes to do your job is what is called the user time which in this case is 0 because it is too short to measure ok it is much less than 1 millisecond. So, let us uh, yeah. But then you would go along a diagonal you would increase both of them at the same time you want 
very small values of x and large values of y simultaneously. So you do do need the two nested loops. Okay. So suppose we uh, increase this from 100 to 1000. Uh, roughly, what should be the time dependency on the radius? Radius squared, right? The radius squared, four radius squared points on this, right? So, or radius, yeah. Um, let us see. So, I increase it to 1000 and I compile it again and I time the run. Well, this time it is showing through 96 milliseconds and the number has also improved to 3.1415. Okay. Now, in this case, however, I have a stable algorithm in that if I keep on increasing radius, I should not easily get those floating point problems which will give me dot values, right. Because yes, the both the numbers will increase, but the numbers will increase within reason, it is just radius squared. And so, I can really take radius to astronomical levels and get more and more accurate estimates of pi. Okay. So, you know you should play with this code offline and this used to be uh, 96 milliseconds for 1000 for 10,000. So, I increased uh, this by a factor of 10 and so the time should increase by a factor of 100 which means I should take about 10 seconds yeah 9.58 seconds. Right. So, if your job is CPU bound and there are not any large memory artifacts like giant arrays or matrices then these kinds of envelope calculations are very accurate. The machine works at a constant speed and you know if you can do uh, 1000 square things this fast you can do 10,000 square things you know 100 of the total speed. Yeah. Huh. Yes. Yes. Hmm. It will not. So, when you say say radius times radius and radius has already reached the upper bound of double say then radius times radius will become infinity. So, will it store it somewhere and then some it will be stored as a double register where the value will be the infinity code. It will store it as a double. It will store it as a double with a special value infinity and if you compare infinity to infinity the result is almost always false. You cannot compare two infinities. But so, you realize that this is a more reliable algorithm except it is much slower ok. Even at uh, after 10 seconds uh, my value was only 3.14159. So, I got it right to the fifth place but nothing beyond compared to that the earlier methods were converging to better values much faster ok. But this sort of integration is a little more reliable you want to overflow easily. So, that is uh, ok uh, one more interesting comment. So, you might argue that well I am kind of replicating work by going from minus radius to plus radius. I can easily go from 0 to radius in the positive <laughs> quadrant and do one fourth of the work right. So, try this out initialize x to 0 and y to 0 instead of radius you will see something interesting happen. You will not converge to pi ok I mean apart from the factor of 4 of course. So, you do the adjustment of 4 even then you will not and you have to uh, tell me why it misbehaves if you switch the lower limit from minus radius to 0 ok. See if you can figure that out ok. Okay, the next problem um, is also a nested loop problem, but uh, it is about strings. So, suppose we are given two strings one is called needles the other is called haystack and the problem is to find needles in the haystack. Needles has no repeated character ok, needles has only distinct characters in it. Haystack may of course, repeat characters and the question is how many characters in needles appear in haystack at least once. For example, is if needles is equal to bat and haystack is tabla, then observe that in some arbitrary order b appears in tabla and a does and so does t. Therefore, the answer should be 3. Whereas, if the input is tab which is functionally equivalent to bat and haystack is bottle, then t and b are found, t is found twice, but that does not matter. And b is also found in bottle once, a is not found and therefore, the specified answer should be 2. Suppose that is the specification of your problem. So, how do you find needles in a haystack? Okay. First, we will look at a sub problem which is instead of being given a bunch of needles, 
if I give you only one needle character called CH, can I detect if the character appears in a string haystack or not? Okay. And that is pretty easy. So, given a one character CH and a string, find if CH appears in the string at least once. So, character CH is suitably initialized, the string haystack is suitably initialized, and um, let us say the answer is going to be an integer 0, which I will increment to 1 and only 1 if the character is found in the haystack. So, that loop is pretty easy to write. You say int for int hx equal to 0, hx less than haystack dot size, and you can implement that optimization I showed if you want to, uh, plus plus hx. Now, in standard coding practice, it is also quite common for programmers to use as an index variable the initial character of the variable you are stepping through followed by x, okay. So, haystack hx makes code easy to read. Okay. Uh, then you say if ch is equal to haystack of hx, then you increment the answer from 0 to 1, and as soon as you do that, you are out. So, use that break statement to quit the loop. So, that at output, the answer value will be either 0 or 1, 0 if needle was not found and 1 if ch was found at least once in haystack. You do not even wait around for the other values, you break immediately. Okay. So, the sub problem is easy to solve and now, uh, if I have many needles, then I need a nested loop. I read string needles and haystack from uh, cm and I still initialize answer to 0. Then I have an outer loop, which is the needles loop. Okay. So, int n x equal to 0, n x less than needles dot size, n x plus plus n x and inside I initialize c h to needles n x. Now, it reduces to my known problem, right. So, then I have exactly the same loop body as before, if uh, for int h x equal to 0 and so on, if character equal to haystack h x, then increment the answer, okay, and then break. Now, this break will only break the inner loop, it will not affect the outer loop, okay. So, you are abandoning the haystack loop because you already found one occurrence of needle c h, but you go back to executing the next iteration of the needles loop. Uh, when we use break, hmm. so does it go out of only one block? It goes out of the innermost block in which the break appears. No, no, if uh, so break does not affect the if, break affects the closest enclosing while, do while or for loop or switch that is the condition. Break is exclusively applied to loops or switch. The switch break is a little different as you have seen, it is a case separation construct. Loop breaks break the innermost loop. There are ways by which you can declare a label and then break out of several loops at the same time. Generally speaking, you know using break and continue indiscriminately is a bad idea. You should really use break only to break from the innermost loop and nothing else. So, quit on first match and then you know you end the two loops and output answer at the end. I am not printing that in this, but if you implement the code, you will print out answer at the end. So, for uh, needles, let us put that bat and say bottle. So, 2, A does not appear. And the fact that t appears twice did not affect the results. Now, if I however, give something with repetition, suppose I say bata and bottle, okay, that does not matter because a does not at all appear in the other guy, it is still 2. But if I say um, input something like tata and bottle, okay, now what happens? I should have gotten, you know, so I, I count one for each t in Tata, not for one t in bottle, each t in bottle, but the two t's in Tata count for two. If you want the answer to be still one, then you need to somehow deduplicate Tata before you get started. Okay, so that's the sub problem here which is or the generalization can you work in case needles also has repeated characters. Okay. So, the specification is that uh, if needles is equal to bata and haystack is tabla, I still want to print 3. Okay. So, I do not want to account for you know um, the a's multiple times and there are two approaches. I can do an I, a 
pre processing on needles so that it is deduped or deduplicated there are no duplicate characters. If I can do that then I will reduce it to a known problem. The other is to dedupe needles on the fly inside the needle loop. So, let us look at these two approaches one by one. So, one is that I will a priori deduplicate a string. So, how do I do that? Is a string needle and I have a deduped version where there are no du duplicate characters. Okay. Now, I could say something like for and remember they are initialized and then say I read uh, needle from stdn or in whatever way and now I start iterating through it int nx equal to 0 nx less than needle dot size plus plus nx. Okay. What should I do here to plug in only distinct characters in needle into dedupe? that is a nested loop as well. Okay. So, what I have to do is I have to say something like boolean um, already found say equal to false right and then I have so I am considering so this is the needle string and I am considering the position n x for inclusion in the output dedupe. I want to find if there is that same character any place up to and excluding that in the left of needle. Okay. So, I say for int l x equal to 0 l x less than n x plus plus l x okay. and the condition I check is if um, say needle l x is equal to needle nx then I have already handled it right. So, at this point I set already equal to true and I do not need to check for anything more. So, I break the lx loop okay. this breaks the lx loop fine. At this point I basically say if not already then dedo dot append needle n x and then I close the n x loop. Okay. So, this format is clear right. How many people are comfortable with what is happening in this code? I have a stepper n x going through needle for every position of n x I have another stepper l x which checks if any position to the left of n x already had that character. If I have already copied that character then I do not copy it to dedo otherwise I append it to the output string. Okay. So, if I had bata as input b is transferred because there is nothing before it see in case n x is equal to 0 I initialize l x to be equal to 0 and this test fails. So, that this loop will not be executed at all. So, the limits all work out nicely. So, b is transferred to the output a you test whether b is equal to a it is not. So, a is transferred to the output similarly tree is transferred to the output this a is lost because I match a previous a fine. So, this is how you can dedupe needle first and then you can invoke the earlier code that will do your job. But there is a second way which is that you know in the old code I had the following um, structure I said for int n x equal to 0 etcetera for the needle loop and then here I had the structure for int h x equal to 0 and this was the haystack loop okay. that was the broad structure of the code. What I will do is instead of creating a new variable called dedupe a string I will check whether I need to deal with n x or not earlier in the loop. Okay. So, this code boolean already equal to false and then the code that found out whether already should be true. So, this part okay. so, let us say this is code number 1 
that code will be inserted into the loop here. So, there is no storage required for dedo. I will check it on the fly and then at this point I will write something like if already continue ok. That is a new keyword. So, this statement we need to understand what it does. So, if the character at position n x was already found earlier in needles then we abandon the rest of the loop. So, continue means execute the stepper. So, abandon this part execute the stepper of the loop you are continuing and then get back into the next iteration. So, the statement is if you have for in it condition stepper and inside you have some statement s 1 and then after some checking some condition you do a continue and then you have s 2 ok. If the condition is not satisfied then continue is not invoked and your loop iteration goes like s 1 s 2 s 1 s 2 s 1 s 2 etcetera. The first time that this condition is correct and continue is invoked s 2 for that iteration is no longer invoked. So, your sequence will be like s 1 stepper con s 1 s 2 etcetera depending on what happens after that. So, of course, you do not technically need the continue statement instead you could write it as if not already then do this stuff and close that bracket. But if you are writing a long loop body then indenting it more and more increases the difficulty of reading it and using one or two continues in a loop is ok right. So, use it with discretion. So, that is how you find needles in haystacks. Any questions about the string examples we have seen so far? How many people are whose unfamiliarity with strings is interfering in understanding this or is it clear enough that strings are just arrays of characters and we are manipulating them. So, people who are finding it uncomfortable to understand the string examples ok or to pitch the question the right way how many are comfortable with understanding this. So, the next example shows the use of parallel steppers. So, sometimes it is uh, useful to have multiple variables stepping through arrays and here is an example. This is a little contrived, but we will see good applications of it uh, in the next couple of slides. So, suppose uh, I want to print a string in some crazy order print the first character then the last character then the second character then the second last character and keep doing this until you meet in the middle ok. So, we can do it in um, you know careful ways by doing index arithmetic we can say if the size of that is n and I start with 0 then I print say uh, l x I print n minus 1 minus l x. So, I can do some index arithmetic, but you have to get all those indices right and it is much easier to issue two steppers. So, I start off with l x equal to 0 and r x equal to message dot size minus 1. I continue un while l x is less than r x while they have not collided in the middle and the stepper is now two parallel operations ok. I increment l x I decrement r x much easier to read ok. So, and I output l x and uh, message l x and message r x. Now, observe that the entire string may not be printed right. So, if the string is odd length the middle character will get omitted. Okay. Now, what are the uses of parallel steppers? Suppose, I want to reverse a string. So, you are printing it in that crazy order, but I can now put that to advantage to reverse the string in place without creating a different string. How do I do that? I start with l x equal to 0 r x equal to that last position and then inside the loop I use a temporary variable say or do some other tricks that I have indicated to switch between message l x and message r x ok. So, again uh, when message l x is used in the right hand side expression then it is a character value. Whereas, when message r x appears as the left hand side it means write temp the character temp into the slot indicated by the left hand side message r x. So, suppose I have a string hello with l x pointing to the first position and r x pointing to the last position. 
So, temp will become H, the first position will be reassigned to O and then Rx position will be assigned to H. As a result, I will get that and then Lx will step forward, Rx will step backward. Okay. Uh, similarly, you know uh, E and L will be switched and then Lx and Rx will collide at the middle. In this case, it does not matter if you collide in the middle and omit the middle character because there is no reversing it. Okay. So, this can reverse a string for you in place without allocating a new string right fairly easy to do. Okay. Next example, suppose I give you two strings which are exactly the same length and I want you to compare them. By comparing I mean you have to output an integer which is negative 0 or positive according as the first string is less than the second string equal to the second string or greater than the second string. Now, how do we define less than greater than? Remember that the ASCII codes of characters is such that say small a is less than small b is less than small z. Okay. Now, for simplicity assume that the input string is strictly lower case characters only okay, from a to z. Now, in particular suppose we want to return the difference of the first differing character. Okay. So, that will do the trick because until things are equal we will not react the first differing character you return the difference of the character ASCII codes and that will make sure that the smallest string comes out to be negative. Okay. So, suppose my input strings are AS and BS which is suitably initialized and let us say my answer is 0. Now, I have this uh, because they are exactly equal length I just need one stepper. Okay. So, int I x equal to 0 I n equal to AS dot size in a real code you should check that the lengths are equal and not trust the specification um, and then plus plus I x. Now, inside I have an assignment expression we have talked about this before. So, you assign to answer A s of i x minus B s of i x. Remember characters are integer types. So, you can take a difference of two characters. It may not be printable, it may not make sense, but it is an integer. Okay. And if that quantity the answer which is the difference is not 0, then you break the loop and finally, you output the answer. So, what is going to happen is if the strings are identical you are never going to take the break, you are going to run through the loop normally and exit because i n becomes equal to i x and at that point you will output 0 which says the strings are equal. If at any intermediate point the characters differ then answer is going to be set to a non-zero value and the loop will break and will print out that non-zero value. If uh, if those are the input strings at the first iteration h will compare to be equal and nothing will happen at the second stage answer will be set to e minus a which we know will be positive and that is what will be emitted. Okay. So, this will basically translate into the statement that a s is greater than b s where this greater than is defined over strings of equal length. So, how do we compare strings? Now, um, now of course, all strings in the world are not the same length and you know to write to compile a dictionary or a telephone directory, we need to deal with strings of unequal length. We need to deal with very short names like Smith versus Krishnamurti, right. So, Smith comes after Krishnamurti in the dictionary even though Smith is shorter because it starts with S, right. So, let us make up these rules. Okay. So, hello will be less than help. Why is that? Because the first differing character, let us try to generalize this to strings of arbitrary length. That is it, everyone is convinced. So, we will say that hello comes before help, sort of like Krishnamurti comes before Smith, okay. because the first differing character is the L and the P in the fourth position, and L is less than P. So, therefore, hello is going to be less than hell, but hello is going to be greater than hell just because hell is shorter. So, shorter words will come before suffixes. Okay, that is exactly how dictionaries are compiled, right? In a dictionary order, this will be the order. Okay. So, the, the technique is that we scan both strings from the beginning. If a differing character is found, then the job is the same as before. We return the difference of the character values. Okay. Otherwise, if 
one string ends earlier than the other, then it is less than the other. That is the convention. And this is easy to code up. We initialize the for loop outside. So, by the way, in when you write for init con stepper, any of those could be empty. Okay. If there is no stepper, then the job of stepping must be done inside the loop body somehow. If the cond is empty, that defaults to true. So, the loop will keep on going unless you break inside. And even init can be empty, which means the initialization has already been done by the time you entered the for statement. So, in this case, we have an empty initializer. Okay. I start off with answer equal to 0, a x equal to 0, b x equal to 0, a n and b n set to the sizes. And then for no initializer, while answer is equal to 0, okay. um, and a x is less than a n, b x is less than b n. Okay. Strictly speaking, we do not need the answer equal to 0, because if the answer turns out non-zero, we will break immediately. Okay. And uh, the conditions are that I have not run out of either of the strings. And the steppers are parallel, so ax plus plus and bx plus plus bx. Right? Now, in the loop, I just say if the difference of characters at the current position is non-zero, then break. But what could happen is that if this loop terminates normally, okay, what is normal termination? It could terminate because either of the strings have finished. In which case, answer will never be assigned to zero. So I check that. If answer is found to be zero then I reset it to a n minus b n. So, in case one of the strings is larger than the other, this will result in answer becoming non-zero again. Okay. Now, you should convince yourself that in all cases of loop termination, that last patch will do the right thing. Suppose the strings are actually equal length and they end at the same time okay, and the loop normally terminates, it means that the strings have to be equal. So, I let answer equal to 0 finally as well. If the loop terminated because of a differing character, then this will not even execute. If the loop terminated because one of the strings was strictly shorter than the other, then this will again do the right thing. Fine. So, this is how strings of arbitrary length are compared to each other using what is called the dictionary order or the lexicographic order. Okay. Later on, when we look at sorting and searching, you will realize that this order is very helpful because you can now take all citizen with ration cards or something and you can sort their names. And the advantage of keeping the names sorted is that if I am looking for someone, I can create indices on it. See in telephone directories, there are these tabs which give you A, B, C, etc. So, if you are looking for Krishnamurti, you can quickly skip to K. You do not need to do a sequential scan from the beginning of the telephone directory to the end, which would be very, very painful. So, similarly computers and databases where they store these kinds of strings and people's incomes and their tax returns for the last year they always stored them in with various indices on them, where the keys are kept sorted. Now, to access someone's income tax record, you do not need to search the whole database. You access the index to go into a small block and then you look inside the block. Okay. So, that is why we care about ordering of strings and ordering of other numbers. So, any questions of on comparing strings of unequal length? So, this is easily coded up and it will it should do the right thing. So, in case you set answer to a n minus b n, the answer is not a difference of characters, but that is ok. At the end, what I care about is the sign of the answer, whether it is negative, 0 or positive, nothing else. So, so, in summary, we have looked at many, many other examples of for loops. So, we started with while loop, then we went to for, which gives you a little syntactic comfort of declaring the initializer, the stepper and the loop body and the condition all in one shot. And then we saw that we need this, you know, it is convenient to have these two new constructs. One is continue and the other is break. Break we have already seen, continue we saw today. So, if you want to abandon the rest of a loop body and then continue with the next iteration of the same loop, then you use continue. If you want to abandon the rest of the loop body and abandon loop entirely, then you use break. Okay. Continue and break affect only the immediate containing loop. If you do not want that, if you want to break or continue outer loops, you have to assign names. So, you have to say this loop is called foo, this loop is called bar and you have to say continue or break with a label. Okay. That is somewhat discouraged because it makes code harder to read and even harder to maintain as you, you know, change the logic. So, basically use only sparingly in a clean well lighted area. So, do not uh, don't play with break and continue too dangerously. Okay. So, um, that is pretty much what I had for today. Next time, we will go outside the paradigm of character arrays and look at arrays of double precision numbers, integers and so on.